Jim Larkin arrived in Dublin in 1908. To some, he came as a savior. To others, he was just a troublemaker. Larkin's troublesome plan was to organize unskilled and low-paid workers into one big trade union. I remember my dad once in O'Connell Street, he pointed up to the statue and said, there you go, that's your great granddad, and I didn't believe him. You look at photos and you think, is she one of them? Is she standing there? And at 15, did she stand and think, this man is just amazing, and he's going to help all of us here. But employers led by William Martin Murphy were alarmed at Larkin's growing influence. In September 1913, they began to dismiss union members and replace them with scab labor. Within weeks, 25,000 workers were on strike and their families on the breadline. You were whisked back all them years ago and just thought, oh, my food parcel's coming. <laughs> The city was divided in a bitter struggle over union recognition and class power. The right eyeball was disintegrated and the middle ear was opened. The skull was practically like an eggshell. He was seen as a scab and nobody seemed to want to help him. I wouldn't say they were incredibly happy, to be honest. I mean, Elizabeth looks quite worried. The chap that's delivering coal produces his gun. She just completely in the wrong place at the wrong time. I am proud of William Martin Murphy and what he achieved. That's the image of a man who created so much employment. It left a legacy that affected families on both sides of the Dublin lockout. My name's Miriam Ann Larkin, and I am the last Larkin in Ireland. Miriam is the great-granddaughter of Jim Larkin. She's proud of the connection, but growing up, she knew little of the man behind the big reputation. I've married recently myself, and I've decided to keep the Larkin name. And hopefully when I have children, they'll have my surname too. Did you ever hear him speak? Larkin! No. This centenary year of the lockout is Miriam's chance to find out more. My brother Dennis is a big Larkin, you know, big Larkin fan. Big Jim Larkin was raised in Liverpool. He already had success as a union organiser in Cork and Belfast before his mighty wave hit Dublin. Larkin started a new type of trade union, the Irish Transport and General Workers, to fight for pay rises, better conditions. But most of all, he wanted change. The, the employers objected to Larkin because he was trying to organize unskilled workers. And they believed it was dangerous to put a weapon like trade unionism in the hands of the unskilled, and the economy couldn't afford it. There's a very lengthy preamble to the original ITGW rulebook, which effectively talks about the Workers' Republic. So it lays its cards down, and that would have been the message that Murphy would have picked up, that this was not just a trade union. Larkin was one of a new generation of socialist agitators who were there in Britain, there in France. Murphy compared Larkin with Emile Pato, the syndicalist leader of French electricians. And he said, uh, you know, Pato was run out of France and we're gonna run Larkin out of Dublin. Now Larkin has said he's gonna speak on Sackville Street today. Dead or alive, he said, and he won't let us down. Larkin's message was irresistible to the low paid. By the summer of 1913, the union had grown to over 20,000 members. Now I'm going to Sackville Street, he is coming. He is coming! In just a few years, Larkin had become a national figure, but his private life was kept in the background. The Larkin family rented a house in Auburn Street in Dublin's north inner city. It's where Jim Larkin completed the 1911 census. The first thing that strikes me is it's all in Irish. 
We've got Seamus O'Lorcoin, Eilish Nilorcoin. I can't pronounce the other one. <laughs> I think it was him having a bit of a dig, to be honest. People saying he wasn't Irish when he came from an Irish community. I think it was his way of saying, I'm here and I am Irish. Um, Age-wise here, he put in for himself age 31. He was much older. But also his wife's age, you can see a 20-something, but that's been scribbled out and 31 has been written in very black ink over it. Possibly he could have preferred to be in a bit younger. But also, there was no vanity when it came to his wife when he aged her so much, you know, I bet she was happy with that. <laughs> Having another five to six years put on her. You've got Jim Jr, who was six. Dennis, my grandfather, who would be two. With a person like Big Jim, he was so passionate about what he was doing at the time. So he was neglecting his family. And I say all his attention and energy was going to the unions, to the lockout. It was basically, I think, just coming home for sleep. It's the choice he made, wasn't it? The slums of Dublin have the dubious distinction as the worst in Northern Europe. In 1913, more than 100,000 people lived in crowded and derelict tenement housing. Photographer John Cook and his assistant captured some remarkable images in September of that year. They photographed what they saw. Um, they didn't leave things out just because it was ugly. They were not professional photographers, either of them. Um, but I think that's the reason why these photographs are so interesting and so special. When you see the condition that many of the houses were in, the scars throughout the city of houses that had been demolished, the rubble that was just simply lying around, the mud on the streets and in the little lanes, particularly the alleyways and courtyards, Well, there's the one photograph of the interior of one of the houses on Francis Street. And there's a bed in the photograph, which is really the main part of the photograph. And then you look closely and you realize that there's actually a little child asleep in the bed. And I don't think she's just having a nap. I suspect that she's very, very ill and sick. And she's probably one of a large number of kids in that family, all sleeping in the one bed. Killer diseases such as TB and pneumonia were rampant in the slums. Children were most at risk. They, they probably were ready for Larkin, but they wouldn't have heard much like this before. The idea that somebody, particularly a big, tall, handsome man with a huge voice and a, a great talent for rhetoric, suddenly arrives in town and starts preaching the divine gospel of discontent to the wretched of the earth is remarkable. He's a celebrity, and we have to remember that, that he didn't have microphones, but thousands of people would turn up for his speeches. He had a powerful voice, but he couldn't be heard at the back of 10,000 people. So as he's speaking, there are people passing his sentences back from one to the other over their shoulders. Larkin was standing up for them, and he was, he was, he was the voice. Imagine someone listening to Larkin and going back to the tenement house and saying, what a speech. That man knows what he's saying. That man knows our conditions. He knows what we're going through. Just a few streets beyond the tenements, it was a different story. The Catholic middle class was on the move and enjoying a new affluence. Dublin's electric tram network was one of the finest in the British Isles and a huge source of pride. William Martin Murphy was in charge of this efficient service. He was a wealthy and powerful businessman with a string of interests across the city. Murphy's tramway company was an obvious target for Jim Larkin. Early in 1913, Larkin began recruiting the relatively well-paid workforce into his expanding union. One of the reasons he was successful was that William Martin Murphy, for the only time in his life, was out sick. But when Murphy came back in July and found out what was going on, he was horrified. 
Murphy acted decisively to remove the threat. He began to fire workers who dared to join the Union. It was a ploy that forced Larkin's hand and propelled the city into lockout. The men said, look, you recruited us, this union. You said you'd get us better pay and conditions, and now we're losing our jobs. So what are you going to do about it? The union's response came on the morning of Tuesday, the 26th of August. It was Ladies' Day at the Dublin Horse Show, and Murphy's trams were busy. Larkin picked his moment to strike. At 20 minutes to 10, the network ground to a halt. On cue, drivers and conductors pinned on union badges and abandoned their trams. The plan Larkin had, he looked at the schedules of the tramway company and he worked out that most of his members would be concentrated around Nelson's Pillar at 9.40 a.m. on that morning. So he reckoned if he could stop the trams at that precise moment, he could jam up the whole system. The men left the trams, some of them even took the spare handles with them to ensure they couldn't be readily started again, and marched off to Liberty Hall. Tom Stokes' grandfather, John, was among the first tram drivers to walk off the job. For somebody like my grandfather, that decision that each man had to make, will I do it or will I walk away from it? was a huge one. I think that his own rebelliousness would have made him go on with it. Uh, but for all, all of the tram drivers, this was a huge step. To take that control lever, the key, out of, of the tram and to walk away and leave a, a tram load of people behind, that was it. Your, your job was gone. Uh, he certainly didn't do it for an extra bob or two. It was motivated by uh, a belief in what Larkin and Connolly and others were saying about workers' rights and about making progress. Larkin's plan was to gridlock the tram network, but Murphy had other ideas. Next up in ring one, we the strike looked like a damn squib. The problem was that Murphy had spies and he had replacement crews, went out to all these trams and even took spare handles. So the system was up and running again within an hour. Murphy's shrewd anticipation of the strike delivered round one to the bosses. But events in the city were about to spoil the party. Later that night, Jim Larkin addressed tramway workers at Liberty Hall. If the employers want war, he said, they can have it. Over the next days, workers clashed with police reinforcements sent to keep the trams running. Baton charges left hundreds injured and two dead. On Sunday, Larkin defied a ban and appeared in disguise on the balcony of the Imperial Hotel on O'Connell Street. The hotel was owned by William Martin Murphy. It's almost a piece of theatre. And Larkin, he was quite good at theatrical gestures. So you could blame him for, once again, displaying that egotistical side of his character. Perhaps he would defend himself by simply saying it was important for him to show defiance. In the uproar which followed Larkin's arrest, police attacked the crowd in O'Connell Street, battering hundreds to the ground. Later that evening, tenement homes were attacked and ransacked. The employers had the back end of the state, the police as well, and they used those to maximum uh, effect. And that meant, look, let's get this under control once and for all. So the police were determined to take no prisoners. When they got the chance to lay in at the crack of a few heads, oh, they didn't hold back. Just two days after the Batten charge in O'Connell Street, disaster of a different kind hit the tenements of nearby Church Street. It must have been a nice evening. There's a lot of kids playing outside in the streets. And there was a play on in the fire match hall across the road here. Uh, the play, by the way, was called the Colleen Bomb. And the people actually inside in the hall thought that the noise of the buildings falling down were sound effects belonging to the, to the play because whoever was running the play was seemingly was famous for these sound effects. It must have been a tremendous crash because there was a policeman on duty on the keys and he actually heard the noise and he ran all the way up George Street. He gave them a dig out there looking for the people in the rubble. Number 
number 66 Church Street, home to five families, was first to go. The collapse came without warning. Victims were trapped by falling rubble. Of the seven dead, three were children. All we could do was roll them up on a sheet. We couldn't lift them. They were like jelly or pulp, smashed to pieces. The body of one victim, Margaret Rook, was so shockingly mangled that it was impossible to identify her. And Margaret Rook was my great-grandmother. Um, she lived in, a, in number 66 George Street. The legend in my house when we were kids growing up was that she was decapitated, and according to the newspaper reports, I'd say it was right. This was a really shocking event that happens right in the middle of the lockout. And this was to have a, a very dramatic effect on what was to happen next. The day after the Church Street collapse, Murphy persuaded 400 fellow members of the Employers' Federation to turn the screw on Larkin. Employers gave workers an ultimatum, stay clear of the union or face immediate dismissal. Murphy was absolutely determined to smash the transport union. The thing about the transport union was it had this man, man leading it as far as Murphy was concerned and had this syndicalist ideology which wanted to basically create a workers' commonwealth and in the process expropriate all his businesses. Look at me brother, Dennis the Scarp. To keep their jobs, many workers were required to sign a pledge renouncing the union. If they refused, they were fired on the spot. You read? Yeah. I hereby undertake to carry out all instructions given to me by or on behalf of my employers. I believe you. And I'm further agree to immediately resign my membership as the Irish Transport and General Workers. Resign, now Dennis! I will not join as a point on the union and I will not join You should be ashamed of yourself. Putting your name to this. My name. My father's name. It's only name. a piece of paper. A piece of paper. Would you sign that? Would you? It's over, Charlie. It's not over. William Martin Murphy, he realised that you could trump the threat of a general strike with the reality of a general lockout. And he pointed out to the other employers, these men have no resources. They cannot survive on their own. If we put them out of work, they have to come back on their hands and knees. He had deeper pockets than the unions and he knew he could win. And Murphy was the type of man who would do the sums. The bosses will speak to us soon, Dennis. They'll agree to collect the bargain. Collect the bargain! Charlie, the bosses can hold on for as long as they want. They're having three hot meals a day. When's the last time you had a hot meal? Within weeks, 25,000 workers and their families were affected by the lockout. What are you going to do then? For people with very little, the consequences were grim. What are you going to do? Even though it's been signed this morning. The Tommy signed. Two scabs! Charlie, you want to Scott! I'm not a scout. Jeremy! By the end of the first week, this is no longer a simple industrial relations dispute. It's, it's something far wider, and there's a lot more things at issue than whether the tramway man get their increase or not, or whether somebody joins a trade union or not. It's about class power. Stick your hands up. Don't be shy. Don't be shy. OK, so we've only four dockers. I thought we had eight. What we do is, when the vessel bears, there's eight little sacks of food. The dispute started as a row over union recognition, but it soon became a daily struggle to find enough to eat. Food supplies were disrupted by strikes and pickets. Prices rose sharply. For weeks, Jim Larkin promised union members and their families that help was on its way. In late September, like a miracle, the aid finally arrived. If you could imagine that this guy has said something absolutely absurd, I'm going to bring a ship of food in, and you gather on the keys and all sorts of stories floating about there's a ship but Larkin's on it, there's no ship, etc, etc. And then it arrives in, and it's full of food. It's just quite unbelievable. And perhaps the thousands that lined the streets in 1947 when he died were either there on the day or had, were there on the day through the stories of their parents and, and grandparents. Janine Kyle's grand aunt was Alicia Brady. Age 15, Alicia was a union member locked out of her factory job. When we could see the ship pulling in, they were all ah, waving their vouchers. So all of a sudden you were whisked back all them years ago 
and just thought, oh, my food parcel's coming. <laughs> Before it was just stories that my granny told me of the story of Alicia Brady. Today, doing this is when I got the sense of Alicia. Seeing little kids, the rush to get bread, and there was a bit of nostalgia. <laughs> the SS Hare was only the beginning. Between September and January 1914, Aid to the value of over 100,000 pounds sterling was sent from Britain, worth an estimated 20 million today. Uh, the food aid is an expression of a beleaguered people knowing that there is support coming from who knows where. They were not on their own. There was a, a sense of solidarity. After all, no other union had ever fed people like that on that scale before. So the union is acquiring again another uh, coat of paint, which is transforming it from something which is simply a trade union to something which is at the very fabric of your life. It's not a lark, it was a lump in my throat, you know, because you think she stood here and, oh, what is that? <laughs> oh. Four hundred employers supported the lockout, but Larkin's anger was directed at their leader, the man he labelled a capitalistic vampire. For a Catholic businessman in the south of Ireland a century ago, he was unbelievably successful. People that worked for his companies would often talk about how he basically ran them like a military commander. It was a good job to have, but it was a tough job. The people had to really earn their money. Along with the tram company and the Imperial Hotel, William Martin Murphy controlled Cleary's department store and two newspapers, the Irish Independent and the Evening Herald. I am proud of William Martin Murphy and what he achieved. One of the things that I really remember from my childhood and also from working there was walking through the machine hall in Independent House when the three machines were going. The Murphy family connection with independent newspapers spans four generations. Jerry Murphy retired in 2009 after nearly 40 years in the advertising department. It was a noise of power. We are producing something that's going to affect thousands of people. And it was my great-grandfather started it. That was my pride. The people here on Saturday, uh, when the president, I believe, is laying a wreath at the uh, at the statue to Jim Larkin. It's all going to be Jim Larkin is a wonderful person and William Martin Murphy is a swine. It annoys me, but when you're one person fighting the entire anti-Murphy group, what can you do? Well, in the lockout there was, unfortunately, blood spilt on the streets, but there was also an awful lot of ink spilt at the time. There was a propaganda war going on Every Saturday, the Irish work would be published, and that would essentially be replying to lots of attacks that would be happening against the transport union and against Larkin and Larkinism in the mainstream national press. The union paper, The Irish Worker, helped lift the morale of strikers and their families. William Martin Murphy was a favorite target. Larkin was always somebody who liked putting a face on the enemy. Some people will look at Ernest Cavanagh's cartoons and they will think they're far too vicious, they're far too vindictive. But I think with Larkin, he didn't really care. On the surface, Murphy seemed untroubled by the attention. At the end of a day's work, he travelled by company tram to his home in the Dublin suburb of Dartry. I have been here before. I was only a very, very small boy. The house itself hasn't really changed much. And I remember vaguely this monkey puzzle tree. I remember the little maze, the little uh, box hedge. I, I mean, I have to say, I'm lost for words, really. I had never seen this particular cartoon before, and I must say that I find it very, very upsetting. That this creature is standing outside a house that's the image of a man who created so much employment. Could anybody, faced with that, be anything but upset? Much of what happened in 1913 
was a personality war between Jim Larkin and William Martin Murphy. And you've got two demagogues on either side of the battle. The losers, I think, at the end of it were the workers of Dublin. On December the 18th, Alicia Brady was on the keys to collect her food parcel. It was called the puck. My granny mentioned it before. I got some bread, jam, sugar, tea, butter, and some fish. I'm going to say what would be on my mind would be, I can't wait for dinner today. <laughs> you know, it's going to be a good meal. Alicia never made it home. She left the docks and walked home through Pier Street and that's when tragedy struck. Food wasn't the only import into Dublin during the 1913 lockout. As the dispute spread, employers needed workers to replace the ones they had locked out. 600 dockers arrived from Liverpool. They lived under police guard on board ships in the port. They were moored in the middle of the Alexandra Basin. Entrances were guarded by the police and military, so no one could interfere with them. Within the city, it was more difficult because scabs or strike breakers had to operate uh, in, in more exposed situations and in small groups. Employers got around that problem by using their power, most of them were justices of the peace, so they could issue firearms licenses. And many of them actually gave not only licenses, but guns to the men they were employing. And there were a lot of shooting incidents in the city. But no scab went to prison. I mean, people went to prison for throwing stones at trams or obstructing a tram or standing on a picket line, but nobody went to prison for shooting anybody. Again, it reinforced the sense of, you know, one law for them and another law for us. But not all strike breakers were from overseas. Employers also recruited workers from counties and towns beyond Dublin. Brendan Murphy's granduncle, Thomas Harton, was a farm laborer at Williamstown House in County Meath. Taking off the whole one, to bring it back to a wild you know. Harton was unmarried and helping his parents support a family of eight. My uncle, Thomas Harton, was employed here, so he was milking the cows and all that sort of thing. He was mad to get to the city, Dublin. <laughs> yeah, to Dublin. Yeah. And uh, he got up one morning and he told them that uh, he would be back home for his dinner. He didn't come back for his dinner. And he never came back. <laughs> never came back. And he went to Dublin. And that was the last time. That was the last time he, he seen ever him? stood, yeah. That was the last time. The landowner at Williamstown had family connections with Tent Castle McCormick's. The company was a major coal supplier in Dublin. The firm was one of the first to dismiss workers in September 1913. Men from Williamstown, including yeah. Thomas Harton, were dispatched to Dublin as replacement labour. Yeah. Oh, really? yeah. They were called scabs. So they were. But down here, would they have been yeah. called it before? No, the... no one ever, ever mentioned. Because for the simple reason is that everybody around was working, connected here, let you know. Yeah. So, so they, they wouldn't dare say on, because they had brothers or sons of their, uh, their uh, walking here, as, you know. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, so. Well, same as my Uncle Thomas, let you know. He didn't have a choice, really. But he really. had no choice. He had no choice. It was either go or your job was yeah. gone. There was someone else ready to walk in there the next day. It seems that he got the job through the owners here. I guess my dad would have thought that maybe, you know, I suppose there was a bit of a force there to go. You know, trying to get into his head, I'm sure, as a man at 31, I mean, it probably would have been a, just a completely different opportunity, you know, to see a big, you know, a city, a bustling city, trams, shops, all this excitement going on, shows, you know, bars. Harton arrived in Dublin just as tension over strike breaking reached boiling point. 
he was seen as a scab and I suppose it's, he didn't matter. It didn't matter whether somebody was kicking him or nobody seemed to want to help him. Because that's what he was seen as, is just a scab. Christmas 1913 came with no promise of an end to the lockout. Daily conflict erupted between union members and the strike breakers who had taken their jobs. Alicia Brady collected a food parcel on Dublin's Keys. As she headed home along Pierce Street, a row flared between a group of women and a strike breaker delivering coal to St. Mark's Church. The strike breaker was allowed to carry a gun for his own protection in case of strikers attacking him, and they did that day. But in the meantime, we have Alicia passing here, going home. The chap that's delivering coal produces his gun, a shot is fired, she's just completely in the wrong place at the wrong time. She was shot in the ham near the tomb, and she was in, but locked her. I believe it, that the jaw gets locked, but I'd say it was very, very severe. She put up her hand and the bullet went right through there. She got slept the seam, I'd say. Yeah. So that was the 19th of December and she died the 1st of January. There is no photo of Alicia, but her family says she was very like her younger sister, Martha. And did Granny ever look like she was getting upset when she'd talk about it or? You just imagine if you come out of school and somebody met you outside of the school and just said your sister has been shot, you would get a blooming shock, wouldn't you? That I would never leave you. The nearest thing they have ever is Bridget. And I think she is the closest thing to a photograph we could get to Alicia, which is nice. Do you look at photos and you think, is she one of them? Is she standing there? And then you look at them for so long, you can nearly picture her there, you know, in these old clothes. And then you try to think, by this stage, it was going on three months in this picture. Was she full on looking? Was she tired? Were they cold? And at 15, did she stand and think, this man is just amazing and he's going to help all of us here? You know, and if we keep going as strong as we are, we can make a change. In December 1913, the union was handing out £3,000 in weekly strike pay, but the crucial aid lifeline from Britain was drying up. The union's kitty was down to less than £700. Pressure on Larkin took its toll. He was often missing, under arrest, or campaigning in Britain. James Connolly was drafted in from Belfast as Larkin's deputy. With Larkin, he liked you or he didn't like you. And you know, if you got on his wrong side, life could be very uncomfortable. Whereas at least with Connolly, you knew where you stood and he would go by the rules. But for Larkin, there were no rules. He was the rules. Of the two of them, James Connolly would be far more methodical. He, he described um, Larkin as being more interested in the Larkinite movement than the Labour movement. That would drive him to despair. But Larkin wanted the limelight focused on himself. He had a suspicion, I think, of rivals emerging. He, he also suffered, I think, seriously from jealousy. The Larkins were threatened with a Christmas eviction from their house in Auburn Street. Like other families, they refused to pay rent during the lockout. A rare newspaper photo taken in December shows Jim Larkin after a prison release. I haven't seen this photograph before. I was quite surprised seeing it, seeing the whole family together. I'd guess that it was probably taken here in relation to the door. I wouldn't say they were incredibly happy, to be honest. I mean, Elizabeth looks quite worried. But there was a journalist for an English paper that came round and wrote just a very small piece on um, Big Jim being released from prison. What he called it was a rebel's wife. And what he wrote here about her was, she seems to show the strain of being a rebel's wife. Although she is herself keenly enthusiastic for the cause of labour, she has three children, the eldest boy at school, but smilingly declared that they were too young to be rebels yet. She 
looked after everything, the house, the children, but I don't think she was getting, what she really needed was um, the love, you know, because his energies were elsewhere. It's possible that he was bipolar because he, he went through bouts of depression and then he went through great bursts of energy. I mean, he, at, at times he had an almost superhuman energy. I think his life must have been one of highs and lows, but he does make reference before the lockout to seeing a, a doctor in London for depression. After the lockout, Jim went over to America. He went over to gather a bit of financial help for unions back in Ireland. That would have stayed with her, being left behind. He came back in 1923. And when he came back to Elizabeth, I mean, she spent all these years on her own raising boys, raising four boys at this stage. And I don't think it was that easy just to walk back in and pick up where you took off, so um, they did separate. I say it was probably very difficult to live with. Brendan Murphy is tracing the story of his granduncle Thomas Harton, a strike breaker from County Meath. Harton came to Dublin at a bad time. Scabs had been warned to stay in at night under the watchful eye of the police. But Harton and a friend broke the curfew to spend the evening on the town. Returning to their lodgings, the two men were confronted. It was around this area here that Thomas and his friend George were set upon. They hit him and knocked him to the ground. Thomas actually managed to get away over the Haypenny Bridge here. He actually managed to run. I'm sure he was running as fast as he could at that stage after what had happened. Harton made a run for it along the quays, but was caught near Liberty Hall and beaten with an iron bar. Post-mortem examination showed a severe wound on the eyebrow and the right side and base of the skull was almost completely shattered. The right eyeball was disintegrated and the middle ear was opened. The skull was practically like an eggshell. Maybe he was wrong to cross the picket with everything that was going on, but maybe he felt he was trying to improve himself, you know, coming up to a city, to a job, you know, to, to get away from, from down home. The Irish Worker, from its first edition almost, publishes rhymes and songs decrying the scab, the black leg, the cuckoo in the nest. That notion of scabbing, even today, and we're a century afterwards, still has connotations. Uh, because of betrayal, because of the breaking of the solidarity. If you scout, well, you know what the price is. And the, the least thing it is is social ostracism. The worst thing it is is lying in a pool of blood like Thomas Hahn. It was actually a horrible, horrible way to die. He was, you know, none of his family obviously would have been around. He would have been on his own in a, in a city where he didn't really know. And maybe 14 people watched him die and yet not one person actually came to help him. So it was a very, very lonely way to die. The lockout had dragged on for four months. All efforts at compromise between employers and trade union came to nothing. Life in Dublin's poorest tenements was close to breaking point. Children were suffering gravely from the results of the lockout. Child mortality was rising all the time. It went up by 50% over the period of the lockout. So their lives were in danger. And any mother and fathers looking at this would have been torn in two. Liberty Hall fed 3,000 people a day. Often mothers coming to Liberty Hall were forced to eat on the premises. They were given stew, basically, in, in, for fear that if they didn't, they'd take all the food home and give it to the children. The price paid by ordinary people was enormous. Um, and how they survived, um, we, d we don't really know. And a lot of them didn't survive. Alicia Brady, the young girl who was injured by a ricochet of a bullet, wouldn't have died from that wound, only she contracted tetanus, and she mightn't have contracted tetanus if her immune system hadn't been so low because she'd been out of work for so long. Time was running out. Larkin had traveled to Britain 
in a final attempt to convince trade unions there to strike in sympathy with Dublin. What does he have? He has blood on his hands. He's got people whose children are starving. There's a photograph of Larkin, which was taken in, in late 1913, where he looks utterly haunted. But there wasn't the hope in hell of getting uh, sympathetic action there. And they say this loudmouthed uh, Liverpudlian who's gone over to Ireland, landed himself in a mess, and now he expects us not only to pay for the mess, but to actually have strikes in this country that we cannot win, simply in order to get him out of his scrape. Early in the new year, even Larkin was forced to accept defeat. The slow drift back to work began, but on employers' terms. I think Dublin employers come out of this very badly. They knew they were going to win at that stage. They'd employed a lot of strike breakers. They were going to keep those strike breakers. They were going to teach an object lesson to the unskilled and semi-skilled workers of, of Dublin. You don't join a union, and if you do join a union, you'll be punished for it. John Stokes, the driver who abandoned his tram on the first day of the strike, never got his job back. William Martin Murphy and the other employers uh, compiled a blacklist of people that they wouldn't have work for them again. And I would say that my grandfather would have been on that list. Even if he had been offered the job of tram driver, he wouldn't have taken it. My grandfather had his own blacklist and there were people that he just wouldn't work for. The outcome of the 1913 lockout was that for, for many years, my grandmother struggled to feed the children, which is a, a cost that they carried. Uh, you could say to win the rights that many of us enjoy and are glad that we can have today. The union paid for Alicia Brady's funeral. She was only 15 when she was shot. James Connolly said that every scab employer in Dublin was morally culpable for her death. Well, I remember saying to my mother one time, who did Alicia look like? And she pointed to her chest and she said, me. And she obviously missed her so much up to she died because she did speak about her. And she used to go mad when people would call her Alice. She would say, no, she's not Alice, she's Alicia. She wanted better, not just for herself, but for everybody. Even though she was only 15, I, well, I'd like to think that that's the way she would have thought that they deserved more. And when she listened to James Larkin probably saying the same thing, she thought, well, yeah, we do deserve more. William Martin Murphy said he wasn't opposed to trade unions, just what he called Larkinism. Now, having seen off Larkin, he was a hero in the eyes of his fellow employers. Dear Mr. Murphy, the citizens of Dublin desire to express to you their appreciation of the great services you have rendered to the industrial development of the city. Your services have saved the city from a peril that threatened to destroy the industrial enterprises of the metropolis. The fact that the Employers' Federation had got this done in appreciation for his services over the years, uh, it kind of took my breath away. It's a beautiful piece of work. I'm more inclined to go along with the sentiments expressed here rather than the kind of rebel-rousing sentiments that are being expressed in other quarters. How many statues in O'Connell Street put bread on the table? William Martin Murphy, if he gave employment, people got paid. When he died five years later, Murphy left a personal estate valued at £250,000. £50 million in today's terms. Larkin couldn't accept defeat. He couldn't accept the idea of giving in to Murphy. So it, it must have been uh, agonising for him. He became more withdrawn and detached. His colleagues found him increasingly awkward, so to the point that by the summer of 1914, they were suggesting he go to the US for rest and re recuperation. Larkin spent nine years in the United States where his trade union and communist activities landed him in trouble. He was jailed for two years on a charge of criminal anarchy. James Connolly led the Citizen Army, a workers' defence force, towards armed rebellion. Connolly was executed 
in the aftermath of Easter 1916. James Larkin was deported to Ireland in 1923, just as civil war was coming to an end. After a power struggle in the ITGWU, Larkin was expelled from the union he had founded. He became general secretary of the rival Workers' Union of Ireland. Although he was elected three times to Dáil Éireann, Larkin never regained his earlier prominence. This is my granddad's pipe, one he used to use. It's a great thing to have that, because it's something so personal. It's something he had with him every day. and Well, it reminds me very much of him, because he very often, when I was going in to see him, he'd very often be using it, you know, yeah. or just holding it for comfort in his mouth sort mm. of thing, you know. The workers lost the lockout, and yet they still believed in Larkin, they still believed in the union. And, you know, it's a great testament, I think, to, to Big Jim. They absolutely insisted that, that he was the man. Sorry, but... Someone said to you, look, you have your heroes. And I say, yes, I have your heroes, Larkin and Condy. You can only admire somebody that stands in your corner. When you can't stand up and you have people like Larkin and Connolly standing for you, that means a lot. Sadly, we don't have people like that today. Like, you know, it's a changed Ireland. And I think Larkin deserves his place in the sun. The trade union movement was founded by him. Uh, Connolly was the founder of the Labour Party. I mean, there's two huge figures, not only in the, in, within the the history of the labour movement, but also in the history of the island of Ireland. Hunger, said William Martin Murphy, is a good sauce. I've heard people saying, why are we celebrating a strike? But it wasn't just a strike, it was the closest we've had to a social revolution. We are our enemies. The one thing that looking back at 1913 does is to show you how much they are going back to the sort of thinking that governed the world at that time, where the workers are secondary to the process, where the concentration is on capital, the concentration is on land and property, and, and to achieve greater profits from that, workers' conditions are being reduced all of the time. Quite recently, somebody said, and I have to agree with them, with Big Jim Larkin, it's not his usual pose. They look at him and they see his arms thrown up in the air with frustration at how things are today. I mean, they fought for us to better ourselves and slowly but surely, we're falling back down. We've forgotten how to do solidarity in this country. It's quite remarkable to look back and see how people who had nothing could stick together. They were sophisticated, desperate, intelligent people. And they could see through the difficulty and the pain and the ill health and the squalor that if they were able to hold on to something where they stuck together, it might improve matters. That's a huge lesson. Jim Larkin crossed Dublin City for the last time in January 1947. Thousands lined his funeral route. Larkin's estate was valued at 16 pounds, two shillings and sixpence. Over on to Keane and Vieira pull no punches when discussing careers spent as best of enemies Wednesday night at 5 to 10. Next tonight, primetime.